I'm here with Steve Tozer, who's a professor of education policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago, an expert on school leadership, and also a member of the K3 panel. Hi, Steve. How are you today? Nice to see you. <laughs> so, based on your work, um, what preparation and professional learning do principals and teachers need specifically in K3? Um, as you probably already know, uh, this became a big issue in the state of Illinois for policy uh, discourse, and it, we eventually made a decision to create a new principal preparation endorsement in the state to replace all other administrative preparation endorsements. It's a P through 12. And the argument was that even for principals who don't end up with early childhood programs in their schools, there are things they need to understand about the importance of early learning that are pretty profound. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a second reason behind that is the idea that um, we, uh, if principals are prepared to lead at any level, it creates much greater flexibility in terms of school systems' ability to hire the, the most qualified people for positions. And, uh, and in fact, that's turned out to be true, where we have people with early childhood backgrounds actually ending up in, uh, in high schools and vice versa and so on. Mm -hmm. um, most important for us, I think, is that um, there's a tradition in school leadership where principals, with some humility, will say to their early childhood teachers, you know more about you know a lot more about this than I do. Um, I'm going to let you run the show here. Let me know if I can be supportive in any way. And that's simply not the way to really capitalize on the expertise of early childhood people or to build their expertise further. So uh, two things that I would say that are that directly answer the question. Mm -hmm. One is that um, teachers and principals alike need to understand that job one for improving student learning in a school is teacher learning. And uh, the pre-K through three or the K through three continuum is one that nobody is expert enough in, neither leaders nor teachers. Mm -hmm. And when teachers and leaders work together on that continuum, which means putting structures and systems in place so that teachers can communicate and collaborate with each other on that continuum, an enormous amount of teacher learning takes place. So what we can see is the potential for vertical and horizontal alignment of things like assessments and curriculum and basically creating the kinds of experiences for students in classrooms that re redounds to the learning of the student. But step one is creating the opportunity for learning for teachers and for school leaders mm -hmm. in the whole realm of, of K through three. Mm. And so in, in the program that you direct, um, what increased emphasis on K-3 have you uh, incorporated and what does that look like? <clears throat> right, there are probably two, uh, uh, the two most important things are the default rule in academic classes and a full year fully paid internship that requires experiences in early childhood education. So I'll take the academic one first. Um, our default rule for our faculty in our program is Every single course, whether it's ed law or whether it's ed policy or whether it's instructional leadership or organizational leadership, every single course is required to have an early childhood component in it or the faculty members would have to show why that isn't appropriate. And we have yet to have a single faculty member try to show that early childhood is not important to the content because it is important to the content across the board. We have subject matter specific courses, for example, um, uh, leadership for literacy instruction, a big early childhood piece to that. We have one in leadership for mathematics instruction, big early childhood piece. So uh, step one is to recognize the sort of centrality of early learning um, to everything else that we do in the program that's, that's about leadership preparation and leadership development. Hmm. The second thing is we have a full year, fully paid leadership internship, which which looks like an assist, assistant principalship in practice. Um, we have placements in urban schools, uh, mostly struggling urban schools, in which we have a principal who's actually making progress against the odds. And our placement then is, is in effect an assistant principalship that's paid for by the school district. And um, unfortunately, not all of those placements can be in schools where early childhood is taking place. Some of them are in high schools, some of them are in K through eight settings um, that don't have pre-K. 
Um, but even in the K through eight settings, of course, we can see a good K through three continuum experience. But what we make sure that we do is we have a series of seminar meetings in which our, in which our candidates travel from school to school to get early childhood experience if they don't have early childhood experience. So they meet in schools that have strong early childhood programs so that they can see hands on what it looks like and how principals are structuring the learning climate and learning environment for teachers in this K through three context, or in some cases, pre-K through three. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So um, based on your experiences with the K3 panel um, and your own work, your own research, what would you suggest to state leaders who want to act on the K3 recommendation around workforce development as a policy lever? Yeah, I would say two things. One is pay close attention to that policy brief that you just referenced. Mm -hmm. Also, I would say pay close attention to the much more extended treatment of that that just came out in the um, in the uh, a major 1,500-page uh, study. And there's a very strong section there about work embedded professional development for the workforce, mm -hmm. um, with a strong claim that. If, if teachers are going to continue their learning effectively, principals have to understand how to create learning environments for teachers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a sense in which for our program, the mantra is, and I'll come back to the state policy issue, but for our program, the mantra is job one for a good principal is teacher learning, if, if we're serious about student learning, right? So at the, at the state policy level, I think that the, the, the key messages are, first of all, to recognize that the two of the most powerful levers we now know we have at our disposal to improve student learning are improved school leadership and early childhood education. And we're not talking about both of those in the same paragraph uh, often enough. And so if, if, if the question that we ask at the state policy level is, how can we improve student learning outcomes through these two key levers of school principal development and early childhood program development mm -hmm. that leads us in the right in the right direction mm -hmm. there are many 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 policy initiatives in education afoot in any given state very few of them have the leverage and the potential that school leadership development early childhood development have so it's a matter of getting focus on what really can make a difference in student learning outcomes mm -hmm. Um, going back to um, to Illinois 2010 um, emphasis on pre-k through 12 leadership certification um, what what was the impetus behind that why did what what led to that move by the state because I understand that was one of the first in the country yeah it was the first and, and I, I think that uh, I must say when we first assembled the legislative task force mm -hmm. uh, to to revamp our school leader preparation uh, program and, or, or endorsement in the state, we weren't thinking early childhood when we started out. What we did believe, however, is that we needed to have all stakeholders at the table. We needed to have special ed people at the table if we we're going to really think, rethink how we do principal prep. We needed to have early childhood people at the table. We need to have secondary, elementary. We need to have the teachers unions. So by being, I think, frank with ourselves about who had a stake in school leadership, it created a conversation that we didn't anticipate. And the conversation it created included the early childhood community uh, because we had early childhood reps at the table. Wow. And their argument was basically that if we don't get the early childhood piece right in school leadership, we're overlooking uh, a place where we really do have the power to make change in student learning outcomes. So it very much bubbled up uh, from within that legislative task force. Hmm. So this seems to translate into opportunities that ESSA is creating for states as they think about what their increased autonomy and flexibility is going to be um, under under the new you know federal laws and so or, or federal title title distributions and so. Um, so that would be an interesting model for states to consider as they move. Yeah, I, I think that you're right about this. And I, I think that uh, if you contrast ESSA to No Child Left Behind, uh, two things pop out, I think, that really underscore what you just said. Yeah. One of them is that No Child Left Behind virtually ignored the principalship as a lever for school improvement. It was really focused on teacher accountability, teacher preparation, teacher talent, um, as if 
teachers don't do most of their learning in schools, which they do. Um, and uh, ESSA, in fact, pays specific attention to principals. More importantly than that, it creates the flexibility for states to make decisions for themselves. It's a much less compliance oriented statute than, than, than No Child Left Behind. Mm. I'm not sure statute is accurate, but it's a much less compliance oriented right. approach to improving schools than, um, than No Child Left Behind. And the fact that it gives states um, the decision making elbow room um, to do a better job on the early childhood front and not just elbow room, but resources to do it. Uh, and to do a better job on the school leadership front means that states are going to have a greater opportunity to bring these two powerful levers into the same conversation in a way they haven't done before. Now, do you have to have a preschool through 12 endorsement to make this happen? I think the answer is no to that. I mean, that was our way of doing it. Um, and uh, on, on the other hand, it's one of the ways to symbolically, as well as substantively, put your stake in the ground about the centrality of early childhood education to school leadership as a field. Hmm. So um, in your position, you straddle the, um, the, the university world and the world of district and state policy. Um, what recommendations would you give to researchers who want to increase the, the effects of their work um, to influence um, both state and local policy? Yeah, there's a, um, I, I actually have an article of, uh, called Change Agency in Our Own Backyards. It's a chapter in a book on urban education leadership. Yes. And one of the things that it points out is that if we really want to have influence in district and state policy arenas, some of what we have to give up is some of our own cherished autonomy. That is to say that one of the things that attracts us to uh, positions of, uh, of research faculty in higher education is the tremendous autonomy that this gives us to pursue issues of our own of our own interest. On the other hand, unless we work shoulder to shoulder um, with public schools and with state agencies on the problems that confront them, um, we we are not likely to make much of a dent um, in 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 actual policy change. Um, so, unfortunately, when you work shoulder to shoulder with public schools and with state agencies, you no longer have the same kind of autonomy that you have as a research professor where you can hide yourself in the library, for example, to take one cliched example. <laughs> but the, uh, the reality is living with the rhythms of the public schools and living with the rhythms of state agencies, that's living with a different set of rhythms and a different set of meeting schedules and so on than what, or, than what faculty ordinarily would choose. So I think that there's a, a trade-off that faculty have to be very aware of. If I want to have influence, I probably am going to have to get my hands very dirty as a partner to the public schools as opposed to someone who uh, leads them to, to, uh, to the truth. I'll also say this. Um, one of the things that we uh, believe strongly in our program is the old cliche that, and by the way, the authorship for this cliche is unclear, but the cliche is um, your system, any system, is perfectly designed to produce the results that you're obtaining. And um, part of the system of, of, of failure to change in public schools and higher ed is, is the faculty member voice who says, if they would only listen to me and only, and only read my research, they would do better. And so what I would say is that's part of the system. And for faculty members to break out of that lament means to, again, work collaboratively with those who are on the front lines delivering education to, to people in schools. Very eloquently said. Steve Tozer, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. I nice appreciate the opportunity.